All right, it is December 2020, year of our Lord, um, what is it, the 23rd, and I've been doing some uh, videos and discussing a few books with you, and I'm just kind of uh, kicking back at the pseudo-hermitage here, hanging out, um, enjoying the quiet and the peace, um, and uh, for some reason I felt compelled to talk about this book a little bit. Um, it's a fairly complicated work of theology. Um, Being as Communion by John D. Zuzialis. And um, let me read a little bit about it. Being as Communion, Studies and Personhood and the Church by John D. Zuzialis. The voice of John Zuzialis may turn out to be the fresh voice for which theology and especially ecclesiology have long been waiting in the context of the complete theology, which includes extended consideration of the major theological topics, the Trinity, Christology, eschatology, ministry, the sacrament, but above all, the Eucharist, the author propounds a fresh understanding based on the early fathers and the Orthodox tradition of the concept of person and so of the church itself. His consideration of the local church as Catholic in the literal sense and the need to understand the universal church, not as a superstructure, but the communion of all churches, provides the program for ecclesiology of the future. Yavis Conger has written that he considers the author to be one of the most original and profound theologians of our epoch, and that he presents a penetrant, penetrating and coherent reading of the tradition of Greek fathers. John Zuzialis is Metropolitan of Pergamon and the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, St. Vladimir's Press. <clears throat> Studies of Personhood and the Church. Let's see here. Um, and then, um, let's see. Com Contemporary Greek Theologians, number four. A forward by John Mandorf. Looking for a date here. Copyright 1985, St. Vladimir Seminary Press. <clears throat> so, um, what I want to say about this is, first of all, call me an ecumenist or an existentialist, come at me. No, just kidding around. But, um, you know, a lot of people um, of a more traditional bent, um, especially a lot of the um, actual Orthodox community that I really have a lot of respect for and admiration and tend to side with on a lot of issues, perhaps would consider this to be a work of uh, Christian existentialism or um, um, definitely there's a lot of ecumenical um, movement involved. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff you'll see on YouTube um, with John Zuzialis uh, will be um, Roman Catholic in nature. So um, let me tell you a little bit of my background with this book is being a um, philosophy student as an undergraduate and around the time I discovered this book, um, that's where I was at. I was studying English literature. You know, I, I studied actually um, Russian literature um, quite a bit and I was like an English literature nerd, but I was reading the Russians, to be honest, and there wasn't a specific really Russian department, per se. Um, um, I think a junior, local junior college I went to first, was, um, as I was really um, married when I did my undergraduate studies, and I wanted to take a cheaper route, and I'm glad I did, because I, some of the um, instructors there, they were like, better than a lot of my instructors at Oregon State University, just too particular in the English department, top-notch um, guys, um, the philosophy department, um, also a gentleman there who was very um, informative, and so I was already reading also French, um, some French literature and philosophy, and uh, Sartre, and like no exit, uh, Nasia. I'm just trying to recall where I was at. However, my worldview was deeply and profoundly Christian, and I would say it was somewhat um, 
um, Protestant evangelical only because I was attending a church that was that way, but I was also attending a Russian Orthodox parish. And this parish at the time was under the old calendar and um, it, um, Roker, I'm trying to know if it, I'm trying to figure out, was it Rokor originally or R-O-C-A? I don't know um, jurisdictionally where that was at, but I know that they were in um, communion with um, some Greek old calendar synoid and resistance um, monastics and Center for Traditional Orthodox Studies in Etna. And so um, I had all of that going on. And, um, you know, Orthodoxy at the time wasn't nearly as approachable. Fortunately, um, the priest that I interacted with, um, Father Seraphim Cordoza uh, in Rogue River, uh, he um, came out of an evangelical background. And if you um, read Father Damascene's um, biography of Father Seraphim Rose, you'll see some mention there um, of, Father, of Father Seraphim Cordoza and... Um, where I'm going with this is it wasn't really an easy thing to do. And so I was attending um, um, some services and also going to an evangelical church. But, you know, I talk a little bit about my journey on one of the videos on my channel that you can watch. But I was definitely being drawn in a more liturgical direction, um, reading a lot about Roman Catholicism, but knew that that wasn't for me. But I was attending uh, Anglican um, parish, and so I was just kind of on a similar journey that many converts to Orthodoxy um, go through. I was reading a lot of the Fathers, and um, I met a priest. First, I met a deacon in a um, OCA parish that's in Ashland, Oregon, called Father Ga or um, I'm sorry, um, Saint Gabriel's. Orthodox parish, and um, they had like a church parish and a home church, and then at a um, the Newman Center at Southern Oregon University, and I started talking to um, their first the deacon there and borrowing books from him, and then I may have borrowed um, Sir John Tavernier's A Caucasus of Thanksgiving. And I opened it and I read something about John D. Zuzialis. And I saw that there was like, I think it was like the Archbishop of Canterbury or something along those lines and Sir John Tavernier and, the, and um, all together on the inside cover of that compacted disc. So um, I know I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but fast forward a tiny bit to where um, there was no current pastor. There was no current priest of St. Gabriel's as um, their priest had um, um, died. So um, I was interacting with that community a little bit. Now, to me, they seem fairly um, modernist, and I'm not going to get into all of that. Um, that has caused struggles for me in my journey within orthodoxy, um, and there's just so much to say about all of that, but I don't want to get into it other than I was always kind of under the impression that um, there was a more modernist bent, and um, I don't want to debate those issues. There's so many people that do all of that, but I met with their new priest, um, Father Isaac Skidmore was his name, and he was a very cool guy and, you know, different. He met up with me, and I think he was in plain clothes. And, you know, I have strong views about traditionalism, and I am much, much more on the very traditionalist side of things. But uh, he was just a cool person, and him and I had a lot in common with our background in, um, I guess, Protestantism or evangelicalism and um, studying of philosophy. And I think this is one of the books that he either lent to me at one time, I bought this version here, or he had men made mention of it. And it may have just um, been fairly new or just circulating a lot at that time um, in the 90s. So, um, yeah, and so that's kind of my history with this, and it came into my hands. And then I got very kind of 
skeptical about what I saw going on with the ecumenical movement, and my views and opinions have stayed the same, but they have also grown. I know that's hard to really explain. I don't even know if anyone who's watching this is going to really be orthodox, um, orthodox, or if they're going to really um, know, but since I'm putting it out there into the um, World Wide Web, I would um, hope that I would um, somewhat present my views correctly, and um, let's just say that um, I've come back to this to look at it and examine it, and um, I think it's valuable or I wouldn't be discussing it, um, but... I think that maybe the Center for Traditionalist Orthodox Studies, they may have like an essay that someone wrote in the Orthodox tradition that I'm going to be researching and looking into. If I find out about that, I will let you know. But just from the view of someone who studies philosophy and theology, this is interesting. Some people think it's heady. I think one of my old priests thought it was kind of a lofty pursuit to be reading this. However, um, I do like to read this kind of stuff. And so I suspend, like, you know, I read so many things that I um, don't have to agree with or feel like, yes, this is it. I can differ with the author in question. And I think that's a big part of exploring literature and reading philosophy and theology. Um, anyways, so um, let's move forward with this. Here is his dedication. And let's look at the contents. And then this video is already running a little bit longer than I intended because I gave you all that um, background information. But um, so <clears throat> contents, forward, preface, introduction, chapter one, personhood and being, from mask to person, the birth of ontology of personhood and ontology of personhood. Two, from biological to ecclesiastical existence, the ecclesiological significance of the person. Chapter two, truth and communion. One, introduction, the problem of truth in the patristic era. Two, truth, being, and history, the Greek patristic synthesis. One, the logos approach. Two, Eucharistic approach. Three, Trinitarian approach. Four, the apophatic approach. 5. Christological approach. 6. The approach through the Akon. <clears throat> truth and salvation. The existential implications of truth as communion. Truth and the fallen existence. The rupture between being and communion. Truth and the person. Truth and the Savior. 4. Truth and the church. Ecclesiological consequences of the Greek patristic synthesis. 1. The body of Christ formed in the spirit. 2. The Eucharist as the locus of truth. 3. Christ, the Spirit, and the Church. Introduction. 2. The problem and synthesis between Christology and pneumatology. 3. Implications of the synthesis for ecclesiology. 4. Conclusions. Chapter 4. Eucharist and Catholicity. 1. The one and the many, the Eucharistic consciousness of the early Church. 2. The composition of structure of the Eucharistic community as reflections of Catholicity. 3. The Eucharistic Community and the Catholic Church in the World. 4. Some General Conclusions. 5. Apostolic Continuity and Succession. The Two Approaches, Historical and Eschatological and Apostolic Continuity. 2. Towards a Synthesis and the Historical and Eschatological Approach. 3. Concrete Consequences for the Life of the Church. 4. Conclusions and Ecumenical Debate. 6. Ministry and Communion. 1. The Theological Perspective. 2. The Relational Character of Ministry. 3. The Sacramental Character of Ministry. 4. Ministry and Unity. 5. The Validity of Ministry. Chapter 7. The Local Church in a Perspective of Communion. The Historical and Ecclesiological Background. 2. Questions Concerning the Theology of the Local Church Today. Ecclesiality and Locality. Locality and Universality. The local church in the context of division. List of sources and index. Here is the foreword. And the preface. The introduction, I think, is uh, longer. But let's look at the foreword. Foreword. One of the major and permanent goals of a theologian who wants to express the Christian faith is, as it is held by the Orthodox Catholic tradition, is to be able to do justice to history 
as well as systematic thought addressed to, to contemporaries. In most cases, however, historians limit themselves to history, establishing the facts of the past and leaving open the issue of objective truth. Systematic theologians, on the contrary, neglect the rigorous demands of historical criticism and use the past merely as a source of proof texts selected by them to support their own, so often arbitrary interpretation of the truth. This dichotomy is particularly dangerous for the orthodox theology, which simply ceases to be orthodox if it either neglects tradition uncovered in history and forgets the truth, which is its racing d'etri, the present work of John Zuzialis, should I believe, be seen as important not only because it is obviously transcends the dichotomy referred to above, but also because it succeeds br brilliantly in showing that the orthodox doctrines of man and the church cannot be compartmentalized in neatly separate sections of theological science, theology, anthropology, ecclesiology, but are simply meaningless if approached separately. Only together do they reflect the true mind of Christ, of which St. Paul wrote the true gnosis, defended by St. Irenaeus in the authentic expression of God called for by the fathers of late centuries, abundant in various languages of the Balkans and Eastern Europe. Orthodox theological literature has become in the last two decades much more accessible in English as well. It includes general introductions to Orthodox history and doctrine, some important specialized studies in monographs as a great abundance of texts related to spirituality. In being as communion, attentive readers will discover how these dispersed elements and tradition are linked to the gospel itself, as it was lived by early Christian community and expressed by great fathers. They will also see that it transcends historical limitations and it is immediately relevant to today's problems. This book is not always easy reading. It presupposes some awareness and contemporary theological trends. Zuzialis is disciplined and critical mind finds itself in constant dialogue with others, either giving them credit or criticizing them mostly on the grounds of one-sidedness, i.e. on the ground that they lack the authentically Catholic grasp of ecclesial reality. His thoughts is in many ways close to that of the late Father Nicholas Alphansiev, who known exponent of Eucharistic ecclesiology, but how sharp, and in my opinion, how justified is overlooking, how justified is also Zuzialis's criticism of Alphansiev, was not Alphansiev somehow overlooking the Trinitarian anthropological dimension of ecclesiology? focusing his thought on the local nature of the Eucharistic community and somewhat excluding the problems of truth of the universal presuppositions of unity. I hope the readers will not be set back by the technical character of this book. John Zizielis is actually dealing with the most contemporary and most urgent and most existential issues facing the Orthodox Church today. Unless the visible reality of our church life becomes consistent with that communion, which is revealed to us in the Eucharist, unless our ecclesiastical structures, especially here in the West, conform themselves to that which the Church truly is, unless the Eucharistic nature of the Church is freed from under the facade of anachronism and ethnic politics which hide it today, no ecumenical witness, no authentic mission would, to, to the world is possible. Born in Greece in 1931, John Zuzielis is a graduate of the Theological Faculty of the University of Athens, where he also later received a degree of Doctor of Theology with a thesis on the unity of the Church and the Eucharist and the Bishop during the first three centuries, Athens, 1965. He also studied patristics at Harvard and was a fellow of the Dumbarton Oak Center for Byzantine Studies for several years. He served on the staff of the Commission of Faith and Order of the World Council of Churches in Geneva and was gradually recognized as one of the most influential Orthodox theo theologians of the younger generation. As a representative of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, he is a member of the International Commission for Dialogue with Roman Catholicism. His ecumenical involvement has led him to, to publish a number of articles and studies in various periodicals. Some of these articles appeared in the French volume Le Etre Ecclesiacal um, Paris Labour et Fides, 
1981, these same articles with important additions are included in this volume. At present, John Zizielis is professor of theology at the University of Glasgow. He was also recently appointed to part-time position at the University of Thessalonica. John Mayendorf. <clears throat> Certain parts of this book have already appeared in French in My Etre Ecclesical Labor and Fides Geneva, 1981. The rest are published for the first time here in English, and both cases of text has undergone special revision in view of the present English edition. I should like to express the warmest thanks to my friends, that Reverend John Clark and Miss Elizabeth Templeton, for their invaluable help in translating from the French to the introduction of this book, and to Father Norman Russell for translating so brilliantly chapters one from the original Greek. My special gratitude is due to Dr. Peter J. Busey of the Department of Natural Philosophy in the University of Glasgow for the interest he has shown in Chapter 2 of this book, both as a scientist and a Christian. I am indebted to him for kindly taking the initiative to translate himself this chapter from the French to English. Finally, I wish to thank warmly Mr. Costa Caras for the great amount of time and work he continued in arranging for the publication of this book to him and to his wife, Lydia, I dedicate this book with gratitude for their unfailing friendship over the last years. Yeah, so um, that's and that was um, John D. Zazialis himself. Um, so, what do I want to say about this? Well, um, a couple of thoughts come to mind for me, which is interesting, and I think that I'm kind of um, studying quite a bit of this. You know, I've had on and off an interest in the Jesuits in general. Um, and so there is a tie there, like a trace that I see, um, some Russian immigrant, uh, theological thinkers who are Orthodox, who, um, had, um, pretty phenomenal educations and were affiliated with Fordham and then affiliated with, um, St. Vladimir's Seminary. Um, and I know that I'm probably missing a whole lot here because, you know, I'm just going off the top of my head and it's been a long time, like almost maybe 20 years. I think maybe I got this book. I had to be in my early 20s. I'm 45 years old now. A lot of things have taken place in uh, life, but I am interested in that and see, um, so there's this movement and then uh, these are the scholars who are moving orthodoxy towards like a unification with Rome or a dialogue with Rome. You can back it up and say dialogue. Um, and also um, for Zuzialis' involvement with the World Council of Churches and how that all falls into play with dialogue with other religions. Uh, all very, very um, interesting, especially um, these theologians who are Orthodox, who have ties with... Um, like Fordham and other Jesuit learning institutions. Uh, it's fascinating. And I think a lot of them are also, um, they, there's that Russian and French connection involved in that. And for me personally, I met someone who's very impacting on my personal life. He has now um, um, gone on to be with the Lord, but he, uh, his name was um, Father Andre uh, Yuroslav, and he was a hermit. And he was rejoined into the Russian church. However, he had um, at one time, um, he was, I think he was Jesuit educated. And he was also in like the, um, what is it, were Carpathian Russians? Or what am I thinking of? Um, a group of Russian Catholics who celebrate the Eastern Rite in the Bay Area. Um, and so... Um, I am jumping around a lot and I can just say that Jesuit education is like phenomenal. So myself as a, um, proponent of someone who advocates for the trivium and quadrivium for just educating of, uh, um, you know, young children all the way through high school and pre-university formation here in the United States. Um, I, you know, was in school with some people that had those kind of, um, Roman Catholic, um, educations and they were pretty intelligent. Um, they would be able to pronounce these French terms correctly, French, German proficiency, Latin proficiency, Greek proficiency, not so much, um, uh, Hebrew, but, um, just intelligent people. Most of the Romance languages they had down, um, as even undergraduates. So it's pretty impressive. And they were going to go on to study classics, um, 
so they go on to be doctoral students um, in classics. And so, yeah, so that could be a part of it. They're just places to get these great educations, but there's more. And so I'm inspired now to dig into that. So part of this video can also just be uh, my own reflection and saying, note to self, uh, Justin, look into like the Jesuit um, connection there and orthodoxy and the interplay. You know, I was just watching a documentary about um, Jesuits, to um, India who became sannyasa and um, they were to minister to the people but they adapted um, um, Indian customs and um, also had studied um, Vedic texts and um, sacred books of India and um, you know um, Jesuits are amazing and their counter-reformation feats and infiltration and their ability to um, basically be dropped off into different cultures and that's always amazed me about them, just like um, thinking of the novel Silence and the interplay in the Jesuits in Japan. And um, so, yeah, I guess that's about it. You can't really go wrong about reading this, but um, people who do not really know me, I wouldn't want them to assume that I'm for, for ecumenical, um, the ecumenical movement, or... Um, somehow that I am um, thinking anything other than Christian. Uh, myself, personally, my worldview is deeply Christian, and, um, you know, um, I read a lot of different stuff. So I hope that you have enjoyed this um, look at being as com communion. Um, I didn't even begin to scratch the surface um, on this text, but uh, it's something that you'll find interesting, I think. Um, students of philosophy and theology in general, and someone who is interested in ontology and um, what constitutes a human person and um, just things of that nature will probably um, appreciate this work, to say the least. This is Justin William Savoy, and as always, you can reach me at SavoyJustin123 at gmail.com. S-U-V-O-Y-J-U-S-T-I-N-1-2-3 at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach out and um, contact me. Uh, please like, subscribe, comment below, give me some feedback, um, and I will try to respond to you as quickly as possible. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, we're heading towards 2021. Um, the world's in an interesting state, to say the least. All right, thank you so much. Goodbye.